what, what will Mission Control be getting fed back to it? And wh what are we, Thomas, going to be able to, to see and hear? I, I understand there's quite a delay. Yeah, there's uh, 11 minutes, 22 seconds it takes for signals to come back from uh, Mars at the moment. It's that far away. Uh, so it is a matter of crossing your fingers. And by the time we actually get the first signals that uh, it has entered the atmosphere, um, with luck, it should already be on, on the planet's surface. Uh, that's the kind of delay um, that, that we're talking about. But once it does enter the atmosphere, it'll be travelling at uh, 12,500 miles an hour. It'll, it'll rotate, put its heat shield down towards the, uh, the direction of travel because that is going to heat up to 1,300 degrees Celsius uh, at, uh, well, just 80 seconds after it enters. That's the, the peak temperature. Uh, and then once it gets to about seven miles about the planet's surface, it should be travelling around 1,000 miles an hour. That's when it deploys its supersonic parachute, which apparently was built by a company in Tiverton. The fabric there is able to withstand these extraordinarily high temperatures. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that will then float slowly down to um, a speed of about 200 miles an hour. And that's when it deploys its rocket-powered jet pack. And, and that takes the, the final uh, descent down to the surface. OK, well, we're just looking uh, very closely there into the eyes of some of the personnel of Mission Control in Pasadena. As we've been hearing, there's not much they can do now, and it's less than 30 seconds now until Perseverance enters, as I say, the outer reaches of Mars' atmosphere before it then descends, as Thomas was saying, very, very rapidly indeed, in those immense temperatures and hopefully lands safely on the planet's surface. Let's uh, listen to Mission Control. Entry. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The fit is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. The vehicle should be doing its turns right now. MRO has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target.
person. Well, uh, tense moments, tense minutes there at uh, NASA Mission Control in Pasadena in California. Tension as well, I can see, amongst my guests. And I'd like you to translate some of uh, what we've been hearing there from Mission Control, Libby Jackson. At one point, uh, Perseverance rover was travelling at 5.36 kilometres a second, I heard, and uh, enduring 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. My goodness me, even I can understand that. I mean, th that stress is enormous. It's huge. It has to go from 12 and a half thousand miles an hour down to, you know, a gentle landing. The bit that was making my ears perk up there was when we were hearing that uh, MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, had lost um, contact. It uh, looks like things are going well. That um, was expected. As you uh, plunge into the atmosphere, um, everything warms up. You get a plasma around the spacecraft. The same thing happens when astronauts return back to Earth and the International Space Station. Uh, so it's expected, but any loss of contact with the spacecraft makes your heart uh, jump a little bit. And it was yeah. really lovely to hear that they regained contact. And everything seems still to be going well. We're now into the part where the parachutes have opened. And, of course, all of this has happened. We're now just looking into the past, waiting for telemetry. That's right. Well, let, let's listen into Mission Control, uh, that, confirming that uh, parachutes have opened. It's getting closer. Yes, yes, Sorry. yes. First turn. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. All right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have priming of the landing engines. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to Earth tones. As expected. As expected. Sky crane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown yeah. confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Earth. <laughs> Oh my God.
Oh. 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 Reports they're still getting telemetry from the lander. Oh. Oh. All right, all stations. Oh, we got it. Touch we're down there. confirmed. We're going to wait for the images. I, I, wow. This is so exciting. I, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. He's great. been riding on this. Yeah. yeah, we just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Yeah. It's not, uh, not the flight. Flight. flight, we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity, that is as expected. Okay. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. We have just heard the news yes. that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. So scenes of jubilation there in Pasadena in California, uh, mission control for NASA as NASA's Mars rover, the Perseverance, the most advanced robotic astrobiology lab ever flown to another planet, executed an audacious landing on the red planet, marking the end of its seven month and 293 mile journey. Uh, the reaction of our guests watching that, Thomas Moore, as well as Libby Jackson, manager of the Human Exploration Programme at the UK Space Agency, and Dr Becky Smethurst, an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford. I could see your faces beaming uh, as we saw those pictures. Uh, Thomas Moore, talk us through how significant a moment this is. Oh, it's huge. I mean, this is the most technically advanced rover that has ever been sent to Mars. Uh, it also has, uh, for the first time, a... Uh, a helicopter that will attempt the first powered flight uh, over another planet. So that's a real Wright Brothers moment uh, on, on Mars. Um, all these are significant because they're all pointing in the same direction. We are trying to find evidence of ancient life in one particular region, this uh, crater, uh, the De Jezero crater, which is 28 miles wide that the uh, rover has landed in, uh, and it will explore the sediments there because it once was an enormous lake fed by a river. There is a delta there with deposits that could act as flypaper uh, for these organic signals of, of ancient life. It's highly unlikely there's any life there now because it is a uh, desolate, sterile planet but once upon a time, it had a climate which is very much like Earth's, uh, and, and that's gone. But the, the evidence of life may remain, and that would be a huge moment for, for humankind. Well, yes, uh, so much to explore, so much possibility here. But uh, Dr Becky Smethers, first of all, just a comment on that extraordinary descent uh, by the Mars rover there. I mean, the descent was described as seven minutes of terror before this by NASA, weren't they? I mean, why was it so potentially perilous? And uh, how tense a moment was it for you watching it? It was incredibly tense for me watching it because I kind of know what they're going through. You know, the seven minutes of terror really does describe just the amount of incredible heat that the rover has to um, overcome falling through the atmosphere as well. Its parachute has to release at the right time. It then has to correct its own course to land in the right place in the crater and avoid all of the hazards of cliff edges and boulders that are in the way as well. We're seeing a lovely picture there that's come back from, from the, the surface that the rover sent back, which is great to see. Uh, and so it really is seven minutes of terror because this is not something that you can test at all in Earth's atmosphere. You know, the first time it gets tested is when it's falling through the atmosphere. And so someone has to code up all of those instructions and the, all these things to say, if this happens, do this instead. That all has to be coded into a computer. You know, 
I code every day in my job as an astrophysicist studying black holes. And I can tell you my code crashes every single day as well. And something goes wrong. So I did not envy them, you know, sat in the control room, literally watching as, as their instructions are, you know, interpreted by a computer and, and anything could go wrong at any point. And there's nothing you can do about it because, you know, by the time the signal gets back to you, it's already probably uh, on the surface as we've heard it did actually come down successfully. So I was absolutely relieved when that uh, the call came through to say telemetry received, which essentially meant signal received from the rover and, and it's doing all good. A lot of fist bumping going on there in the control centre as well. You can see the, the relief and, and the joy there too, can't you? Uh, Libby Jackson, we're already getting pictures, aren't we, back? I, I know that there's an 11 minute delay, I think, for, in the signal just because Mars is so far away. But give us an idea of what happens next to Perseverance. Well, the science team, the people in mission control, they are back hard at work. We've got UK scientists who are going to help plan where this rover is going to go, uh, which rocks it's going to pick up, and they're starting work at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's right on to work. We've got about 30 Martian days, 30 souls of checkout to make sure that the rover is all in one piece, um, to make it move, to check the wheels are there, check out all of its instruments. Um, and then it will get to work collecting those rocks. And this is just so wonderful because we have such a strong set of scientists and um, engineers here in the UK building the instruments that are on Mars rovers, building Mars rovers. And this just kicks off the start of our whole series of work that's going to happen here in the UK over the coming years. Um, and it also just means that we've got a mission. Um, it's go. We're going to see those samples um, hopefully returned back to Earth uh, early in the next decade. And the UK is playing a huge part in that. Very exciting stuff, although quite a wait, of course, which is tantalising. Uh, Thomas, I think we do have another picture that has already been fed back uh, from the surface of Mars. Uh, while we look at that, uh, tell us about the wider significance of a mission like this. I mean, it's a question that is, uh, people have asked for generations and generations. Is there life on another planet? I mean, it's, it's a huge uh, scientific question, but also it has wider philosophical meaning for so many people too. For sure. And, the, the, I mean, science fiction came up with this idea of, you know, little green men on, on Mars. And, of course, life on, on Mars was never anything like that. We're talking about microorganisms here, microscopic life that evolved at a very early stage but never really got going uh, because the conditions on Mars, uh, Mars abruptly changed. But the fact that if, if there is life there, uh, ancient life, uh, then for it to have evolved on, on two planets uh, together independently in the same solar system, that really does increase the odds that there will still be life elsewhere uh, in the galaxy, in, in the universe, perhaps multiple times, uh, and that some of that life may well be intelligent. Uh, and I think that really does show that we may not be alone. Uh, and that, do, that is, a, it is an interesting existential question that, that this mission could help answer. Well, Thomas, uh, thank you very much indeed for guiding us t through. And, of course, thanks to Libby Jackson, manager of the Human Exploration Programme at the UK Space Agency, and Dr Becky Smethurst, an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford, guiding us through that extraordinary mission, uh, seeing a NASA rover landing on Mars in its epic quest uh, to bring back rocks that could help answer whether life ever existed there on the Red Planet. Thanks all.